the common modality of governance My name is Isabella Levin. I'm a member of uh, the European Parliament and I'm from Sweden and representing the Green Party. In the beginning, the sea was considered, I mean, eternal, a, a source of uh, an endless richness and, and food. And uh, I mean, at the end of the 18th century, the, the, the leading fisheries biologist said that there's no, absolutely no way you could overfish because if you fish in one place, then the fish will just uh, replenish in another place. And so there's never been uh, considered a need for ownership on the sea. So fishermen always traditionally have had free access to fisheries. And this is something that has uh, con continued um, as a normal practice even in our industrialized time. So it's, it wasn't until in the, 19, the beginning of the 1990s that the real consequences of uh, free access to fishing grounds was uh, recognized. Where, I mean, with a big collapse of the cod in the Grand Banks in outside of Newfoundland. And uh, but still. Even if there has been um, different systems with individual rights or to fish, fishing rights in different parts of the world, like in New Zealand and in, in Iceland and in some fisheries in, in, Amer in America as well and Canada. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 basic, the basis of everything is that the sea does not belong to anyone and fish does not belong to anyone in particular. And lots of fish, they move from one country to another country. So it's very hard to decide who uh, is the, the, the right owner, or I mean, uh, who has the right to fish this fish. And there's always, always contra controversies about this. Um, and here, if you want me to go on, here in Africa, I mean, uh, there's been controversies between neighboring countries, of course, on some fish stocks. But lately, I mean, the last 30 years or so, uh, the big conflict is that regimes here have sold fishing rights to foreign operators, foreign countries. Among those, we have the European Union, but also Asian countries such as China, Taiwan, Korea. We've got lots of them out here fishing uh, with private agreements, fishing illegally sometimes, but mostly with agreements with the government or some official of the government. And what we've been discussing here now is uh, the problem of uh, transparency. We've heard witnesses here from the representatives of the fisheries uh, organizations, the small scale artisanal fishermen here, which say that, I mean, they, they don't get access to the information on how many boats are out there, how, how much are these agreements worth, how much money is in it, how much fish is being caught. And this is really, something is, is very crucial because, okay, the fishermen here, they can't prove that the fish is theirs. And the government treats the fish as if it's the government's fish and uh, sells it. And the money from, from those agreements, where does that end up? That's also another big question mark. It struck me here in this seminar, because I'm not a specialist in land grabbing, but I suppose in villages in Africa, land has been used without any particular owner for, I mean, the, 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 the community has some land and uh, you, you cooperate on how to use that land in a fair manner which is exactly what Eleanor Ostrom is describing on how to use a common in a, in a good way. But all of a sudden, if 
uh, the government decides that now, okay, you have to have a reform on land and, and attribute land to particular owners, then you can start selling the land. And also what we heard here was that local governments, probably someone in, in that structure of, of, of uh, hi hierarchy in, in the, the local governments, can sell the land to foreign investors as well, which has happened. I mean, I'm not an expert in, in land grabbing, but I mean, when it comes to fisheries agreements or sea grabbing or whatever you want to call it, it's lots of corruption going on, evidently. And um, also, I mean, you have arrangements, you have agreements, you have private enterprises, joint ventures, etc., etc. You also have illegal fishing operations going on, but under the supervision, of course, of, of people who see them and just, you know, take some money and, and close their eyes. I was a bit surprised, to be honest, that the, the representative, the director of fisheries from the Senegalese government was so completely evasive. He didn't answer any questions. He's, he, I mean, he took the floor and spoke for 40 minutes or something without saying anything, just stating the obvious about the importance of fisheries, etc., etc. And he refused to answer any questions. I mean, no, I did not foresee that. I thought he was, would be let's say, more flexible than that. But, um, I mean, it was just a, 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 an evidence showing how, this, how sensitive an issue this is. And even if you have, we had lots of fisheries representatives in this meeting from the Senegalese fishing sector. And I noted that not very many of them took the floor either. And which surprised me as well. It's a very sensitive issue. I mean, in Senegal, you have 600,000 people directly dependent on the fishery sector. And then you have the government selling fishing opportunities to Koreans, Chinese, Europeans, and, and all sorts of countries in Europe, and which, of course, is not very much appreciated. And then, no, what the, the, the representative of the fisheries uh, ministry said was that some money is used in investment which has contributed to the growth of the sector, etc. But, I mean, we don't see much of that. I, I've been traveling uh, along the Senegalese coast and, I mean, it's not very much that you see of those investments. And what you see, which is extremely dangerous as well, is that the, uh, the, local, the domestic fishing sector in Senegal is completely irregulated. This is, in, in Senegal, it's still, I mean, it's free access. They're going, I'm, I'm not sure if they have uh, introduced a license system yet. But I know two years ago they, they didn't have that. So here it's free access. And what we heard that is interesting. What we heard was the connection between um, the draw, drought and, uh, I mean, the, the, the difficult conditions for farmers uh, in the recent years has driven people to the coast to find their way of living. So there's all the time more people getting into the fishery, taking boats, getting boats and starting to fish. And this is, of course, also a very tough, uh, sensitive issue for the government to, to deal with, and they are not. They're not. And so, what I know is that uh, Senegalese small-scale artisanal fishermen, I mean, they can fish almost anywhere, anyhow, and any time, which is not a sustainable manage management of fisheries.